And now, uh, particularly in America and Western society, we spend an extended period of time uh, in senescence, in uh, really getting old. So what's happening in your opinion? Well, it, it's what I call whack-a-mole medicine, that most doctors, uh, not all, but most doctors treat diseases. And you know, if you take diabetes as an example, most people will have increased blood sugar levels the older they get. And that's actually a, a very good sign of aging and how long they will live. But if you were to go to a, a typical doctor in most Western countries, they would say, well, you need to pass a certain threshold to be a diabetic and only when you have a disease, I will treat you. You know, go home and don't eat so many potato chips and get off the couch, but I'm not gonna help you with the medicine until you actually have a disease. Whereas we know that a drug like metformin, which is, as far as drugs go, relatively safe, will delay type 2 diabetes if you prescribe it earlier. It's a very cheap drug, as drugs go. Um, and so I, I'm encouraging people, doctors, to think about prescribing metformin before diabetes actually occurs. And it's a lot easier to prevent a disease than to try to reverse it. Yeah, I think that's a, a very good point. And I want to, I think we'll come back and talk about metformin a little bit later uh, because uh, it has, as you and I both know, a number of pluses. And there are some people who feel it does have some minuses, particularly in mitochondrial function. And you're one of the world's experts on how to make your mitochondrial function better. So I, I'm interested in that take. In fact, what the heck? I was going to talk about it later, but let's talk about it right now. Okay. Uh, you, I know, take metformin, yes? Yes. And I don't. Uh, and I maybe should uh, convince me. Come on, David. You and I are sitting around having a coffee. Uh, right. Well, you know, I, I don't want you to live a day longer than you want to, Steve. But, uh, so I'm not going to try my hardest to literally convince you. But scientifically, I'll tell you what I think and why I chose to. And that is that uh, I looked at the data in, let's start with, with animal studies. It's not always the best, but with animal studies, I was on a paper with Rafa de Carlo down at NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and we showed that metformin delays many diseases in those animals, and they, they do live uh, slightly longer. That's good, it's obviously not doing them a lot of harm. And then when I looked at the literature of other people who do, did studies on one study was over 10,000 patients, veterans, that took metformin. Others, um, now 100,000 plus patients who have taken metformin. When they look at the risk factors and the, at the, actually the incidence of diseases of aging, not just diabetes, but other diseases, cancer, heart disease, frailty, Alzheimer's, their chance of getting those diseases went down as well, which is what you'd expect from a, a true longevity, or what some would call an anti-aging drug. And here's the striking thing. Those patients were healthier having diabetes than people who didn't have diabetes. And that's remarkable. So what does that mean for people who don't yet have diabetes? I think it should be even more effective than those people who have been studied. Now, the other thing is uh, I'm doing a risk-reward ratio always with, with myself. What's the risk of not doing anything? pretty high, right? I know what I'm going to be doing 20 years from now. It's not going to be fun. I'm 50. I'll be 70 in 20 years. And But what's the risk of taking metformin? Well, it does have side effects that can be severe. But for most people, the most you'll experience is an upset stomach, which I'm prepared to tolerate and mitigate with the benefit of potentially having a much healthier older age. You know, you and I are probably both aware of recent uh, placebo-controlled trial in older adults uh, using metformin to see if it would actually improve uh, exercise building more muscle mass. And I think the theory behind it was excellent, and I think it was a well-designed study, and yet metformin failed to improve muscle mass generation to exercise. Any thoughts on that subject? Uh, yeah, a lot. I get asked about it every day, and I've talked to the people who ran that study. 
Um, and so I'm pretty qualified now to speak about it. What the study showed, there are now two studies, and if I were to summarize, it would be this, that the patients, the elderly patients that exercised, whether they had a drug or not, metformin or not, all gained muscle mass and strength. There was a slight difference in the muscle mass of those who took metformin. They were generally had smaller muscles, but they were just as strong as the other group that didn't take metformin. And so I've jokingly said that it's a question of vanity versus longevity. Um, but really what I mean is that we're, we're trying to eke out the differences, but the benefits were still there even in the metformin group. Now, because we don't know really what's going on and there might be some negative effects on the muscle, um, even though they were just as strong, I have decided to see what happens if I don't take metformin on the days that I exercise and recover from exercise, which is generally Sunday, Monday, Tuesday for me. Um, and, you know, that's, that's my little experiment. Uh, it's not a clinical trial by any means. But I think in the absence of more information, I think that's a, a reasonable approach. That sounds like a fun thing to do. I, you know, we, you and I uh, have an N of one at all times, and you, of course, have added your father uh, to the N of one. And let me, we've talked about your dad, and you talk about your dad in the book. Uh, your, your dad, talk about your dad, and tell me, tell me the effects of some of your crazy ideas on your father. Yeah, right. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> full disclosure, full disclaimer here. This again is not a clinical trial and it's not going to be published in a journal anytime soon. But my family are a bunch of scientists. My wife's a scientist from MIT. My father's a biochemist. And we can read scientific papers. My father, believe it or not, at age 80, is an independent individual. And he has chosen uh, to, to take my research uh, seriously and has been convinced by himself, not by me, uh, to try things, because he knows what the odds are in his old age of things going wrong. By age 80, most people have at least two or three uh, major diseases that are being treated. Um, he started taking resveratrol early, uh, one of the first people in the world. Uh, this is now going back 13 years ago. And so far, so good. He takes a gram or so a day and the reason I say, Steve, or so is we, in my family, we have powder. We just spoon it into yogurt and mix it around. It's important to dissolve it in something for it to be absorbed. We know that from human studies. And just to, to dwell on resveratrol for a little bit, um, people go back and forth on resveratrol. Uh, I can tell you in my lab, we've, we've definitely proven how it works. Uh, we have new results that I haven't published, but we, we have had a science paper that that was very positive and showed that it's working through the the sirtuin pathway that we work on and we have new results that really nail it you know i don't i very rarely say we proved anything but this experiment that we've done uh, has proven that it works the way we said it did but also what's really encouraging is that there are human studies that are now showing that resveratrol does many of the things that we saw in mice many years ago protects people from high fat, a high fat diet and reduces blood sugar levels uh, which is is great you know, part of the reason that there were there were negative results, I think, in people is that the, the researchers didn't realize that you need to dissolve resveratrol into something that allows it to be absorbed. And when you do that, you get five-fold higher levels in the blood. Uh, so getting back to my father, uh, he's been on resveratrol. He's now on metformin. He's been on metformin for probably six years now because he had high blood sugar. Everyone in my family uh, dies early from diabetes-related uh, complications or heart disease. And he's now the longest lived person in our family, uh, at least in the, on the male side. Uh, and then he started adding NMN, which is an NAD boosting molecule, the same one I take. Uh, he did that, started that about three years ago. And those are the main things. Now, if people want to learn exactly what we do, and it's a, it's a long list, uh, page 304, you can skip to that in my book, uh, but you'll miss all the good stuff. in here. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Steve. But, the, but also in part two of the book, the middle section, it's about things you can do with your daily life, about what to eat, when to eat, what to do with exercise, that the, the science backs up. And 
Steve, you and I have a lot in common in how we approach our daily lives and what we think will improve health. Anyway, I'll, I'll just finish to say that my father is 80. He has no illnesses. He has no aches or pains. He's got as much energy as he did when he was in his 20s and 30s. And mentally uh, and physically, he, he can outpace me. Um, and so, yeah, so far, so good. He's a beacon of hope for all of us. Now, you bring up resveratrol, and I can't leave that without talking about hormesis, because one of the theories of how resveratrol works is hormesis. So what the heck is hormesis, and why is it so important? Right. Well, hormesis is essentially what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Uh, you could possibly say what, what doesn't kill you makes you live longer as well, because what we discovered first in yeast cells that you know you can make beer and bread out of, and eventually in animals and now in humans, we found that these enzymes that I mentioned earlier called the sirtuins, these are protectors in the body, and they do a lot of good things. They protect uh, cell identity, they repair DNA, they boost energy in the mitochondria, which you mentioned earlier. So we discovered that, but then what we realized in the 2000s was that these genes and the enzymes that are produced from them are turned on by uh, hormesis. And what that means is any anything that puts the body in a state of perceived adversity, right? You don't want to actually damage the body to be able to live longer and be healthy. You want to give the impression that times are going to be tough. So being hungry uh, during the day, exercising, these are all things that tell the sirtuin genes to come on and to protect the body. Um, there are some other things that I do uh, such as go to the sauna and jump in cold water baths to try and stimulate and get my body out of its complacency. When we sit around all day, I'm, I'm at a standing desk, by the way, I've, for that reason. Uh, if we sit around all day and we don't exercise and we eat constantly, our defenses don't get turned on. We don't have hormesis. And resveratrol, which we talked about, I've called a xenohormetic molecule, which means hormesis that you get from other species, such as plants. So when plants are stressed, they make resveratrol and other molecules like it. And I have this theory and some evidence that when we eat those stressed plants, our body thinks that our food supply is running out, and it will also have the benefits of dieting and exercise as well. I love that. So uh, the more stressed plants I eat, the less exercise I have to do. Is that what I'm hearing here today? <laughs> Right. Let, let your food be stressed so you don't have to be. Uh. Well, yeah, you know, an interesting aside, um, uh, uh, this is not to talk about, I happen to have an olive oil that has 30 times more polyphenols of any olive oil. And the person who developed it is in the Moroccan desert. And he knew that great wines come from vines that are stressed. They're planted in rocks, they're underwatered, uh, horrible conditions. And he says, you know, I bet you could do that with olives. So he found a rocky part of the Moroccan desert, underwatered them, and planted the vines right next to each, uh, the trees right next to each other so they had to compete. And when he finally made the olive oil, uh, the French government found it had 30 times more polyphenols than any olive oil they had ever tested. And so you're right, uh, a, a stressed plant uh, gives more polyphenols, and resveratrol is certainly one of those polyphenols. So uh, I think you're absolutely right on this. So yeah, so we're all going to go out and eat stressed plants or stressed plant byproducts, and that includes really good uh, red wine. Is, is that true, or is that French paradox a total myth? Uh, I don't think it's a total myth, but the amounts of resveratrol that we find we have to give people uh, would be the equivalent of hundreds of glasses of red wine every day. Uh, work, 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 work. Yeah, the news just, <laughs> just keeps getting better and better, right? Uh, <laughs> but please don't don't overdrink. Uh, the alcohol is, of course, not, not helpful, and there's a lot of calories. Uh, that said, I'm happy to entertain the possibility, and there's some there's some evidence from looking at populations, that drinking a glass or two of red wine over 40 years can be beneficial. And there's not just resveratrol in red wine, there's quercetin and other things, as you know, Steve. Um, and so that cocktail 
with a bit of alcohol may be uh, responsible for some of those health benefits that we call the French paradox, where the French can eat a lot of cheese and fat and they don't have high rates of heart disease. No, I, yeah, I think that's very true. And like you say, and I say in all my books, look, if you don't drink, don't start. Uh, it's uh, rule number one, I think. Yeah. Uh, what's one thing that uh, my listeners can do to stimulate hormesis for themselves? You've mentioned several of them. Yeah. Come on, get, give us an easy one. All right. Well, so, so having read tens of thousands of papers and read your books, uh, and studied this for my whole life. If there's one thing that I could say that everybody needs to do, it's eat less often. Yeah. So that, yep. that's not malnutrition, not starvation. Uh, please, nobody uh, become underweight. But what this means is the three big meals a day with snacks in between, in my view, is ludicrous and has led us into a world of obesity. So I've recently, uh, well, actually most of my life I've skipped breakfast, but more recently tried to even skip lunch and then have a normal dinner. And it's been great for me. And we know in mice, if you, here's something that I'll leave everyone with before we take the break. Uh, I mentioned Rafa de Cabo down at uh, NIH, my good colleague down in Bethesda. He did a study that I think is a landmark. He mixed different types of, uh, different amounts of protein, fat, carbohydrate, and gave 10,000 mice different versions of a diet. And they all lived the same lifespan. The group that lived the longest was the group that gave, that had access to the food only two hours a day, which argues that it's not just what you eat, but when you eat that's important. Yeah, I think that's so important. And, and whether we call it intermittent fasted or I, I like time restricted feeding, which is kind of what you and I do, uh, you're, you know, you're an expert in this field. Would you please tell people why breakfast is not the most important meal of the day? Uh, well, so I found, at least for myself, and I assume I'm an average person, uh, when I measure my blood sugar, so Steve, I've started measuring my, my blood sugar with a patch you can buy. Um, it's prescription only, but still, it's, I managed to convince one, one of my friends to let me try it. What I found is that I, and, and I've heard many others, their blood sugar goes up in the morning. And people like me are not hungry at all when we wake up. Um, and so it's, it's really force feeding um, for many of us. And I can do quite well without breakfast. And I don't need it. I'm, actually, I do much better physically and psychologically, mentally, without breakfast. Uh, so I think for many people, having a breakfast is not just... Um, a waste of money, it's actually, it's dangerous because it's a, it adds up, the calories add, add up fast. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, you know, both our cortisol and our adrenaline levels rise in the morning. And that, of course, both kick up blood sugar. And I take care of a large number of diabetics, many of whom have been on insulin. And one of the things they don't quite get is they always wake up with an elevated blood sugar and they think it's because of what they ate the night before. And most of them, unfortunately, then say, oh my gosh, you know, I've got to eat some food and that will bring my blood sugar down. Well, in fact, when they measure it again at 11, their blood sugar is down and they make this connection mm -hmm. that the food brought it down. Well, it didn't. Uh, their cortisol and adrenaline fell normally. Uh, yeah, and as you know, uh, for the last now, this will be my 18th year, from January through June, I not only don't eat breakfast, but I don't eat lunch. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I'm a mouse at the NIH. Yeah. Uh, I eat all my calories in a two hour window. Right. Um, and so far so good, you know, as I say, I'll let you know when I'm 150 <laughs> if the experiment worked. Right.